The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS. Unlock direct submission privileges. Choose from three membership levels starting at $69. Membership includes money saving quarterly grading specials, PCGS members only show access. I've been uh, to these shows and they are very intimate, high quality shows, great venues. Uh, you also get access to view PCGS graded rarities and a subscription to the Rare Coin Market Report a magazine that will come directly to you in the mail. If you plan to travel to Long Beach, a PCGS membership will also get you two free admission tickets to each of the three Long Beach Expo shows that are held, a $48 value for each show. All of this is included. Visit pcgs.com to learn more. This week on the Coin Week podcast, I talked to Leanna Spurrier, a numismatic writer and videographer, one of a new generation of coin professionals entering into the industry. Leanna writes a column for Coin Week IQ, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to her next on the Coin Week podcast. Hi, Leanna. Thank you for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So we've uh, worked together a little bit over the course of the past year and a half, and uh, you're just now out of college. Uh, you've expressed a deep interest in numismatics and learning about the history of some of these coins, and it seems like you are well on your way to charting a course for a career in numismatics. So as we kick off our conversation, I'd like to ask you, are you having fun yet? Uh, well, I'm definitely having fun. Um I started collecting when I was around 11, seriously, and then kind of, you know, dropped out of it in high school when life got in the way, and then came back my senior year of college. And getting into the field, like, as a professional was entirely an accident to begin with. Um, I, for my major, I had to take a, um, what was it, documentary production class. And so we got a project, and we had to make a short, like, four to six minute documentary on anything historical and we could pick any topic that we wanted and so I collecting coins of course chose a coin um a few months earlier I had actually won this giveaway on Instagram that David McCarthy ran for a replica of the plain obverse Nova Constellatio Quint um and I wanted to know more about that coin so I was like this is a perfect opportunity to learn more and be doing homework <laughs> so I decided to make my short documentary over that and spent two weeks absolutely nose deep in research and it should have taken way more than the two weeks that I had to do the project, but I was determined. So I put that together and then just, you know, threw it up on YouTube and my like biggest hope for the project was that David McCarthy would see it and like it. And that was like as far as I expected it to go. And then, you know, a couple days later he saw the post on Instagram and commented on it, and he liked it. So, you know, my my goal was met, and I thought that was the end of it. And then a few days later, he messaged me and was like, hey, Coin Week wants to talk to you. I'm like, whoa, now what? <laughs> so I emailed you all at Coin Week and got started writing articles for you. Um, and I got an email from the Newman Numismatic Portal to start making videos from them and another club for a series that's coming out later this month. Um, and it just kind of started snowballing from that one video, which was crazy for me. Well, uh, here's a dirty secret. Uh, Dave McCarthy is uh, my friend. And so uh, when he saw your work, uh, he gave me a call and uh, he wanted to tell me about you and the essay that you wrote. Uh, the Nova Constellatio is uh, certainly an advanced topic. Uh, you don't usually run into collectors who are just entering into the hobby, uh, putting together uh, pieces based on a deep understanding uh, of this type of coin. And, uh, so that, that made you a little bit unusual. And so, uh, we looked at it and, and, and thought it would be fun to bring you on board and hopefully mentor you a little bit and get you, uh, where you want to go, uh, exposing your writing and your talent to a wide range of, uh, hobby enthusiasts. Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you're having fun doing that. But, uh, speaking on a sort of a personal level, one of the things you're enthusiasm reminded me of was uh, my own uh, experiences. You know, when I was uh, a lot younger, I would uh, read the Red Book and whatever 
uh, materials my grandmother had around her house. Uh, she was a big collector. Uh, and she had, you know, a few coin books that were written by authors, like notable authors. And uh, I never imagined that one day, you know, when I was reading these books and looking at these coins, that I would, uh, I would uh, get to meet these people, you know. And uh, almost every single one of them has been so kind uh, to me and generous with their time. Uh, and I just think that that's part of the rite of passage, you know. Uh, in this community, we see people coming in and striving, and we, we lend a hand, we help out, we get them uh, where they want to go. And I guess they, uh, it has been the case that they pay it forward uh, once they are established. So um, so I, I imagine that, like, that experience, though, of meeting these people, uh, you know, meeting the Q. David Bowers and, and, uh, and other uh, leading figures has been sort of mind-blowing, though, because it was for me. Very much so. I um, on the I have one video series that is going to be released later this month, and um, part of the review board has been sending them to Dave Bowers. And on the last video that I finished, they sent it out for comments, and no one had any edits to the video. And then I get an email from Dave Bowers, and he's like, great video, but you might want to check the spelling of your name. And so I look back, and go figure, I have misspelled my name on the video. And it took Dave Bowers to catch it. And I'm like, you are kidding me. <laughs> Misspelled it on two others as well. So I fixed it, and it's okay now. But I remember I was uh, working on a book project, and uh, once it was ready for the final edits, they asked Dave uh, Bowers to read it. Uh, and the whole time I was on pins and needles, you know. <laughs> uh, on, this pod, on this podcast, I always try to get guests uh, of the program to talk about their perspectives on the hobby. Uh, you know, what they see is it's overall, you know, health and, and things that they predict will happen in the future. You know, most people's perspectives, you know, are, are uniquely their own. But one thing that usually repeats is the need to get younger people involved in coin collecting and into the industry. Um, so you're a young person. Um, why did you uh, decide to enter the hobby and, and what kind of future do you see for yourself in it? Uh, my draw to it has really been the history behind coins, which is kind of odd because I never really enjoyed history in school. Um, but being able to hold a piece of history then makes it interesting to me. So, like, in in middle school, when I learned when World War II was, it was because of steel pennies from 1943. Like, that was the only reason that I remembered when World War II happened was the steel pennies. And so it just, it makes history tangible in a way that I think is really interesting. And it gives us the opportunity to preserve those pieces of history. Because if we don't have collectors and people who are caring about them, then they're just going to get, you know, dumped in a bag or lost and cleaned. And so I think that having a decent-sized community of collectors is important to be able to preserve these pieces for future generations beyond just having, you know, a couple collections in museums. Um, because it's really about being able to hold and own a piece of history that is appealing to me for the hobby. Um, as for the next few years, I think the coin community has started to embrace the Internet quite a bit. Like when I was in middle school, I didn't really – well, to be fair, I didn't look very much on the Internet for, like, forums or anything on social media or things like that. Um, but now that I've gotten back into it in the past couple of years, I definitely see certain sectors of the hobby really embracing like Facebook communities and Instagram um, forums online and more, more is being available online. And I think that's really important to the future of the hobby because the younger generations aren't, they're not as inclined to go out and buy 10 books. They're much more inclined to spend 10 hours on the computer looking for that information online. So I think it's a very good sign that we're kind of starting to embrace the Internet, and I hope to see the hobby continuing to move in that direction while still being able to maintain some of the um, more traditional things like the brick-and-mortar local coin stores and shows um, and things like that, because I think those are very important for the community aspect of it. Um, and even, like, local coin clubs are kind of – they seem a little bit old-fashioned at this point, but I think it's really – it's a very good aspect of the hobby that I hope will continue into the future. One of the things that I see, uh, I'd like to get your opinion about it, um, 
I largely agree with you uh, about the importance of brick and mortar stores. Uh, but when you look at the retail store side of the market, coins are very expensive. Uh, the desirable higher end coins, you know, from virtually any series, you'll find that better grade material costs uh, thousands of dollars a piece, if not more, uh, typically based on demand from set registry participants. But there are also many other factors. Your brick and mortar store will generally not have enough capital to even make a serious offer on coins like this if they come through the door. And if they could afford it, they, cer they certainly wouldn't be inclined to carry them in stock. Um, so then, you know, even higher grade generic classic U.S. coins, you know, costing, you know, even generic uh, higher end classic U.S. coins will cost thousands or more dollars to buy. Um, you know, add to that the fact that gold is, you know, expensive. Uh, uh, so it's hard to carry a range of gold coins, uh, especially in the collectible grades and collectible dates. And so what we have, I think, is a hobby that has priced itself out of the market for many uh, would-be middle-class participants. And, and certainly, uh, we've priced out a majority of brick-and-mortar stores who can't deal in this type of desirable material. So what you're left with uh, on the retail side over the counter are leftovers, you know, the flea market potluck type of uh, coins. And uh, when I go into any of the uh, handful of coin shops that are left in the uh, central Virginia area where I live, uh, you just get token representation of, you know, the rich and deep history of American coinage. And most of what I see are problem coins that, you know, no collector with any experience would want to buy. And I don't think this is a good look, you know, for the hobby if we uh, are trying to entice new people into joining our community. It, for me, um speaking on the, like, kind of role of coin shops and the quality of stock that they can have. Um, when I first got into collecting, when I was around 11, um, I found one local coin shop that I really liked. There were, I want to say there are three or four in the city where I live, um, but I found one that I liked better than the rest because it had the lower value stock. It was more, you know, kind of mid to low grade buffalo nickels and V nickels and that type of thing, which was what I could afford at 11. And at that point, you know, I wasn't scouring eBay for common date wheat pennies. And so having that local coin store gave me the opportunity to go, you know, I could buy a pound of common date wheat pennies and spend some time going through them. So, like, as an introductory level or as a young person with no money, that was a very helpful introduction to the world of coins for me because I I tried a couple other stores that had more of the – um expensive, graded, high-quality pieces, and I couldn't afford anything. And so that wasn't fun for me anymore because I walk in the door and I'm like, well, that's pretty. Okay, bye, you know? <laughs> so I think I do see your point. And for those with a bigger budget, I can definitely understand that those um, lower-priced coin shops aren't necessarily what they're looking for. And I think that's really where shows and the Internet come into play. Um, I think it would be good to have shops that have a much wider range so you can have both the common day Buffalo Nickels and some nice high-grade Walking Liberties or Morgans or anything in the same place. Um, but that does require a lot of capital and a very determined individual to make that work as a business. Um, so I think there's a place for the low-quality coin shops, if that makes sense. Well, I agree with that. It's just that uh, I think we have to think this through as an industry. Uh, this is a fundamental structural issue that needs to be understood and addressed. I think with the historic rise in the price of coins, and this was led in part by revolutionary thinking and, and, and the emergence of third-party grading services and dealers in the 1980s you know, to support them. Uh, many of the coins that circulated around the country, these desirable coins, became more concentrated in the hands of, you know, I would say, more affluent collectors. Uh, and the incentive structure for local shops is to move this inventory through other means, you know, the Internet, auction houses, nationally known dealers who specialize. And so uh, the opportunity for sophisticated collectors in some city uh, to regularly go to their local coin store and explore new ways to collect just doesn't exist anymore, uh, I'd say, in most places. You know, I grew up by no means wealthy, and even what I had available to me at the time uh, where I could go to a store and they had boxes and boxes of different types of coins 
and a binder after binder of coins and flips. And they had like, you know, junk silver coins and junk, uh, junk, uh, you know, uh, wee pennies and mark cents and whatnot. Uh, and I, even as a kid, I could always find new and exciting ways to spend the, the meager allowance I had at a coin shop. And, and I just don't think that exists anywhere uh, where I live anymore. And so my collecting has largely now been determined by coin shows, online auctions, and uh, direct uh, dealer uh, private treaty transactions, uh, you know, online or over the phone through people I know from the coin show circuit. Uh, but I'm diligent, you know, and I know I can persevere. I don't know if I would have gotten into this hobby or gotten an interest in it as a youngster if all I had to learn from and buy from is what we have now. Uh, I think I try, I generally try to come from a point of view of someone who's going to come into the article knowing next to nothing, especially if it is a more specialized piece. Um, like I've written one on varieties and little um, what's the word? I don't know, intricate things about Indian head scents. And for that one, I figure I can assume that, you know, people know what an Indian head scent is and we can leave it there. Um, but if it is a more specialized or unusual topic, then I try to approach it as though the author, or the reader isn't going to have any background knowledge. Um, and so I'll try to make sure that it's clear to someone who's coming in without that information so that anyone can open the article and understand what's going on. Uh, frequently, I'll just kind of be, I'll be working on another project or something and run into something um, and think, oh, well, that's interesting. I'd like to know more about that. And then I'll add it to my little list of possible articles and come back to it. So when I start researching from the article, I'm coming from that point of view of I don't know what this is. And then I'll filter through the research and all the stuff online or get a book from the ANA or whatever, I need to do to get enough information so that I can boil it down to a more concise article with here are the most important or most interesting features of this, um, but make them comprehensible to someone who is not a specialist and doesn't have that background information. Because I think that's, that's how we're going to get more people interested in the little nooks and crannies of numismatics that aren't as much common knowledge. You have to provide a stepping stone. So when it comes to your own journeys, uh, what are some of the unexpected side streets that you've gone down while doing research on other topics? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I know one of my um, most dramatic side streets, I was making a video for the Newman Numismatic Portal on weirdly shaped coins. So I, had, I was just, you know, going through pictures of different world coins, looking for odd shapes, and I found this rectangular one from Japan. And I was like, oh, that's a cool shape. You know, I'll, I'll include that in this video. So I got one on eBay, and I had to do a little bit of research so I could talk about it for the video and found that there just was not much online. So I did what I could and moved on with life. But I always – I found that one really interesting. So eventually I came back to it and found um, – I found another rectangular coin that was like a similar – series, but it was gold instead of silver, and it was a different denomination. So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll get one of those, sure. And eventually I figured out what the main reference book on them was, and it was only like $20 on Amazon. So I was like, well, I want to know more. I'll get the book. So I got the book. And from that book, I wrote a fairly brief article on them for Coin Week because there simply wasn't information about them online, and I was like, you shouldn't have to purchase this book to have, like, to know the names of the types. So I wanted to put that out there, and then I just kind of dove in head first from there um, and started, you know, I've found the um, Wikipedia pages from Japan on these pieces, and so I'm, like, gradually translating them into English, and I got a copy of the JNDA catalog, which is also in Japanese, um, and translating it and trying to figure it out and, like, being spreadsheets of all the different types and how to differentiate them and just kind of dove headfirst into the series from 16 to 1800s Japan that are rectangles because of this one video. Um, so now that's kind of like the focus of my collection and it all came from this one, I need a rectangle for this project. Right, so what are the coins like in here? Uh, they're, I mean, I think they're fascinating. 
Um, they vary widely. Like the one that I used for the video, um, it's – oh, gosh. Do I have a size reference handy? Um, probably probably like nickel, like the height of a nickel I'm going to go. Um, and they're very, like, thick and weighty, and they're just kind of fun to play with. Um, but the series as a whole ranges in size from um, – smaller than a dime. It's minute to one that doesn't fit in a standard size PCGS slab. It's just a little bit too big and has to be in an oversized holder um, over the course of 1599 through 1869. And so, like, the sizes vary widely, but they're all rectangles, and they all have, like, they have similar design elements carried over, um, so they kind of fit together as a series. Okay, my final question for you. Uh, those involved in the coin collecting uh, hobby have had this multi-generational project of outreach and support for YNs. Um, you're an adult, so uh, maybe not your traditional YN, but you are in the minority of people entering into the profession uh, as someone in their 20s. Do you, do you feel that we may put too much pressure on YNs as they exhibit their first interest in coins, you know, because we want to keep any young person who's interested in coins uh, in the system and develop them to be that next generation of buyer or dealer. Uh, do you think it might be better for us just to let young people find their way into a hobby that, you know, it's open and welcoming to them, uh, but one where, you know, not every youngster is thought to represent the future salvation of the American numismatic marketplace? I think that the hobby has done an amazing job at once a YN is interested, once someone has put their foot through the door, then, like, I have seen so many programs, especially through the ANA, um, like, I know they have scholarships and, like, coins for A's on report cards um, and scholarships for summer seminar and all these different programs. I'm like, I wish I knew that these existed or I wish that they did exist when I was a YN. Um, and so I think once your foot is through the door, then those are amazing programs that I think are very good for keeping kids interested and telling them, you know, you are welcome here. Please come, stay, learn. Um, getting the foot through the door, I think, is kind of the next hurdle that the hobby needs to cross. And I have seen, like, the W Quarter program, I think, was excellent. I think that's pretty much a universal view across the hobby um, and was great for trying to get more people's foot through the door I just think that's the next kind of big hurdle that we need to focus on, and I know there has been focus on it. Um, so I think that's the main thing, barring more young people from being in the hobby, is getting that foot through the door, getting their interest in the first place. Um, as for my experiences, I can't say how much has been because I am younger or because I am female, um, because well, I can't separate the two. Um but it has been very interesting to see how people regard me. Um, one of the first coin shows that I went to was about a year ago, and I went with my dad. And so, of course, he fits a lot more into the kind of standard demographic of the show. And so we'd approach a table, and the dealer would look at him and say, what well, can I help you with, sir? And then he'd just point at me, and I'd rattle off, you know, I'm looking for a Variety 2 Cat Bus Dime. And then you could just see them kind of reprocessing for a second. They're like, oh, I have been mistaken. And then they would address me. Um, but it was just really interesting to see that. Uh, I think the it's commonly an assumption for a young person or a woman, I don't know which is the kind of key factor, but the inclination is to assume that we don't know much offhand. Um and that's, like, that's commonly the case. I make the exact same, I do the same thing. Um, and so for us, it's kind of, there's an extra step of kind of proving, like, I do know what I'm talking about once you get into the environment. Um, and so I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I entirely understand where that's coming from. And it's kind of fun for me to kind of turn the perspective on that. Um I went to a local coin club meeting for the first time a few weeks ago, and um, I walked into the meeting late because I had the time written down wrong. So I walked in 
I was the only female in the room and the only person under, I'm going to say, about 35. Um, so, you know, I immediately stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, and apparently the club normally has a speaker, and then they didn't have a speaker that week. So they're just like, does anyone have any pieces to show and tell? And I'd happened to bring one of my pieces with bar money with me, and I was like, well, okay. So I raised my hand and went up and talked about the bar money, and when I first went up, the, like, officers at the front of, of the room were like, okay, first of all, who are you? Like, <laughs> where did you come from? Because it's unusual for a young person or a woman to just walk in off the streets to a coin club meeting. Um, but after, you know, sharing a little bit about the bar money, I could tell that the people in the club um, treated me differently than had I not gotten to give up and give the little presentation. Because, you know, at um, shows or um, flea markets with coin dealers, they generally, you know, they assume that I don't know much. And, like, I had a dealer to show who was surprised that I knew what a Libertad was called. Um, Whereas after I had given my little presentation, the people at the meeting were like, okay, cool, so what do you collect? You know, how long have you been here? And were regarding me like I did know what I was talking about. And so that's kind of been my experience is that if once people know that I know what I'm talking about or if I enter the conversation as someone working in the industry, like if they get to know me through my work at Coin Week or videos or whatever, then it's incredibly welcoming and people are very excited that I'm part of it um, and it's been a really great experience. And personally, I find it fun that that's not like the initial Reaction. I, people are still welcoming. That's not what I'm trying to say. Um, they're still welcoming, and they're still, you know, happy to see me there, but there's that assumption that I'm not an expert. I don't know a whole lot. And so it's kind of crossing that hurdle that is an additional challenge. All right, Leanna, I look forward to seeing you. We will be meeting up in person later this week at the CoinX show in St. Louis. Uh, what are your plans for the show? Uh, let's see. I, I've made a little, like, 30-second animated promo for the show, and then while I'm there, I will be helping with the, um, I believe we're calling it the Numa's Bids system, um, which is going to be how people can purchase coins from the show while at home. Um, I'm not 100% sure how that will work, so I'm not going to go into the details, um, but that will be a thing, and I'll be helping track down the pieces on the floor and all that. Um, and then I'll be working with you for a couple Live streams, I think they have me on the schedule to be on one of the live streams on, I want to say, Thursday. Um, and then I'll be making kind of a, like, highlight reel recap video after the show. Right. And, and I expect to be thrust in front of the camera. I'll be talking about coins. I have a few topics I will rattle on about. Uh, but what we hope to do is to inform people, educate, entertain them. Uh, you know, people who can't make it to the show, maybe entice those who are close enough to come in person. Um, I think some dealers may want to sell some products during these streams as well. So it has all the recipes of being a, a, a beautiful thing or a beautiful disaster. But uh, uh, we hope it would also serve as the building block uh, and inform us on what we need to know uh, so that maybe in the future we can make these coin shows more interactive, engaging towards the audience. And I look forward very much to participate with the uh, roundtable group and seeing how this uh, beta test will work out. And also, I look forward to seeing you. We shall see how it goes. Okay. Thanks, Leanna. If you like this episode, please share it with your friends. And remember, you can download every episode of Coin Week Podcast for free from the iTunes store or stream them on our YouTube channel or on CoinWeek.com. I'm Charles Ward, and I'll see you next week. Happy collecting.